This is question number 13, key company. Uh, this is taken from, if I'm not mistaken, I took this question from BPP workbook. Not from the practice kit, but from the workbook. Uh, this is about IS-36 impairment and then revaluation. So three topics we are going to cover about it. Um, actually, two are impairment. Two, it has three requirements. Uh, two are uh, related to impairment, and one is related to IFRS 5, non-current assets, uh, you know, held for disposal, held for sale. So key company has a significant amount of non-current assets. There are specific assets on which the directors, key, directors of key wish to seek advice. Number one, so there are three different scenarios. Number one, key holds non-current assets which cost 3 million on 1st of June 2003 and are depreciated on the straight line basis over their useful life of five years. So 3 million divided by five, 600,000 is annual depreciation. An impairment review was carried out on 31st of May 2004. So this is exactly after one year. So 1st June, you bought the asset. 31st May 2004, one year passed, one year depreciation you have charged, and now you are doing impairment review, and the projected cash flows relating to these assets were as follows. Cash flows for the next year, 2005, 6, 7, 8, four years cash flows, 280,000, 450, 500, and 550. So they are giving you cash flows so that you can calculate the value in use. The company used a discount rate of 5%, okay? And this is happening on 31st May 2004. Then another date at 30th November 2004, which means maybe after five or six months, the director used the same cash flows, cash flow projections, and noticed that the resultant value in use was above the carrying amount of the assets and wished to reverse any impairment loss calculated at 31st May. So they thought that, so on 31st of May, they calculated the value in use. They probably had recorded some impairment loss. We don't know how much we will calculate. And five months later, they used the same cash flows. And this time they found out that the value in use is more than the carrying value. And then say that because there is value in use is more. So let's, reverse any impairment losses which we charged few months back. The government has indicated that it may compensate the company for any loss in value of the asset up to a 20% of the impairment loss. Okay. So there is, if the asset have lost value, there is any impairment, the government has indicated that they would do a compensation of up to 20%. Okay, now this is first scenario. Below that is the second scenario I don't want to read. Third, I don't want to read. They say that discuss with suitable computations and reference to the principles of relevant IFRS, how to account for any potential impairment of the above non-current assets in key financial statements for the year ended 30th November 2004. So they have a year ending 31st, 30th November 2004. And then there are mark, uh, mark allocation, and then they show us the following 5% discount factors may be relevant, year one, 0.9524 and so on. Okay, I will draft the response with you in a while, but let's first see the calculations so that we find out the numbers and then we can think about how to draft the answer. So first thing what we need to do, we need to actually calculate on 31st of May 2004, this is the date. Um, I just made it slightly bigger. This is where they were actually um, looking for an impairment review, okay? 31st May 2004. So what happened on 31st May 2004? They had some cash flows. Let me find out the value in use. This is 280. This is 450, this is 500, and this is 550. And they gave us the PV factors, present value factors. 
for year one, two, three, four, year one is 0.9524, then 0 0.9070, then 0 0.8638, and then 0 0.8227, okay? I'll take them up. So these are the discount factors. So present value of cash flows and the sum of this is so value in use this sum I can call it value in use it comes out to be 1559 million now what is the carrying value this we need to see so that we can compare the carrying value with the value in use and we can find out if there is an impairment or not so carrying value would be 3 million, they purchased it. Then there was depreciation. And that depreciation is only for one year because you just bought it last year with a life of five. So okay, so this is the carrying value. Now, carrying value is higher. Now, the principles of impairment, IS-36, it, it tells you that non-current assets cannot be um, shown on the statement of financial position at an amount higher than the recoverable amount. This value of value in use is actually your recoverable amount. So if recoverable amount is less than the carrying value, or if carrying value is more than the recoverable amount, Impairment loss has taken place. How much of that is 2.4 minus 1559? 840,000. This is your impairment loss. And this should be reported in where? Because they are reflecting. Whenever you see impairment loss, you say that assets, are we keeping assets at cost model or we are keeping assets at revaluation model? They are keeping asset at cost model. Okay, why I'm saying that? Because you know that if you are keeping asset at cost model or you keep asset at revaluation model. So if you are keeping asset at cost model, the impairment directly goes to PL without any questions asked. So it means that you can take this thing to PL. Or otherwise, if you are carrying the asset at revaluation model, then you first see that do you have any revaluation surplus? If you have revaluation surplus, you will remove the revaluation surplus. And then if something is left, that goes to PL. Okay. So this thing was explained very clearly in your impairment chapter as well. But I just put it again that if, if the asset was measured at revaluation model and if there was any revaluation surplus, so first you have to debit the revaluation surplus, you have to eliminate the revaluation surplus, and if any extra amount is left with impairment, that goes to PNL. So we understand that there is an impairment of $840,000, okay? Now, how to respond to this question? Now, if we have to plan the answer, I just go, uh, put the numbers first because I wanted to see that what is the situation. So first we will say, we will define, uh, we will make a reference to IS-36 and we will say that how IS-36 defines impairment. Then we will, because it will make reference to the recoverable amount, so we will talk about what is recoverable amount. And of course, when we are talking about recoverable amount, we are talking about the fair value and we are talking about the value in use, okay? So here I'm talking about the principles here. Then what I do, I will tell that what is the impairment which has happened in this case and what is the accounting treatment for that impairment. I will calculate impairment, tell about impairment and then what is the accounting treatment. And number four, it says that, now, 
At 30th November, the directors used the same cash flow projections and noticed that the resultant value in use was above the carrying amount of the assets and wished to reverse any impairment. which was recognized on 31st of May, which means that this impairment, which you recognized on 31st of May, how much of that we can recognize? This is what they are planning to do. Um, here, what is very important, what we need to, again, we need to discuss here or describe here the rules or principles for reversal of impairment. And while describing that rules for reversal of impairment, this word is very important. The cash flows which are associated with the assets have not changed. So you might be thinking that how come this time they have, they notice that value in use was above. How can value in use become more? I mean, these are the same cash flows. So there is only two possibilities. One, they used a different discount rate. Instead of taking 5%, they probably are doing a different discount rate. Or maybe they are unwinding it. So when you unwind, you increase the value. Remember, unwinding of the present value. That is why they are noticing a higher value in use. And IS-36 does not allow that. IS-36 that says that you cannot increase value in use by... In, you cannot increase the value in use or recognize the increase in value in use just because you change the discount factor or just because you are unwinding. That is not allowed. So this, what they're trying to do is wrong. So we will say that this is not allowed, okay? This is my fourth point, which is about reversal of impairment. And the fifth point here will be about the government grants. They say that there is a case, there's a scenario that the government has indicated that it may compensate company for 20%. And what to do with that? Now here, the government grants, which they are going to give you, it is not a standard actually. Um, it's not a government grant, I'm sorry. It's not a government grant. It's a compensation by the government. Because if I say word government grant, you might be thinking about IS-20. So it's not IS-20. It is something that the government has given an indication that they will compensate you for any losses. So that will be considered under IS 37 provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets, okay? And that is supposed to be a contingent asset. But if you remember that from the lecture videos, we know that contingent assets, they only are recognized when they are virtually certain. Virtually certain means that you are 100% sure that it is there and you treat it as a receivable. But in this case, it's not virtually certain because number one, the government has not made a promise. It has just indicated and it says that it may. So it means that it is not virtually certain. So we have we, we just have to ignore it. Yeah, if it is virtually certain, then we should take it to profit and loss account and we record a gain. But because it does not... Uh, you know, um, meet the criteria for contingent asset. You cannot recognize it as contingent asset, so you will just ignore it. These are the five things which you should be talking about in this discussion of this question, okay? Um, I'll start with IS-36, impairment of asset. It provides guidance. And the and the and the and it lays down the principle of impairment, which says that assets should not be reflected or should not be shown on the statement of financial position at an amount which is higher than the recoverable amount. One sentence. The second sentence explain recoverable amount. Recoverable amount is the higher of fair value, less cost of uh, fair value, less cost of disposal, and the value in use. Fair value less cost of disposal means the market value of the asset, which is um, the fair value as determined under IFRS 13 principles and cost of disposal are if there are any costs which are associated to sell the asset. Whereas the value in use is the present value of the future cash flows which are generated by the asset. So we calculate these two numbers, value in use and fair value, whichever is higher that should be considered as recoverable amount. 
in this case we have been given information we have been given so i have done this thing very quickly and i have done this thing and now i'm on to point number three the asset was purchased one year ago uh, the cost was three million and it had a life of five uh, five years. So therefore, the annual impairment is 600,000. And on 31st May 2004, end of year one, the carrying value of the asset was 2.4 million in the books. Then you mention, if we see the cash flows for the four years, and we and we discount them with the 5% discount rate, we can see that the value in use is 1559. And you have to put these numbers, okay, you have to present this table value in use is 1.559 million. And because the carrying value is above the value in use, therefore we can say that impairment has occurred and the value of impairment is 840,000. So you talk about impairment. Now think about accounting treatment. Uh, Non-current assets can be or IS6, under IS16 PPE, PPE non-current assets can be measured, subsequently can be measured either at cost model or at revaluation model. If the assets are measured at cost model, in that case, the impairment is charged to the profit and loss account. However, if the asset is measured at the revaluation model, then we need to see if there is any revaluation surplus available or not. And if there is any revaluation surplus, first we have to reverse the revaluation surplus we have to eliminate the revaluation surplus and any further additional amount is left in impairment account that should go to the profit and loss account. Because this asset was measured at cost, at cost model, therefore the impairment of 840,000 should be straight charged to the profit and loss account. This point is also done. Okay, so you have already done point one, point two, point three. Now come reversal. Um, it is mentioned in the scenario that directors, they have remeasured the asset on, um, on 30th November again, using the same cash flows. However, using the same cash flows have given them a value, which is the, um, the value, the, the value in use, which is greater or which is more as compared to 31st of May. Now, because they are using the same cash flows, so the only possible reason why they are getting a higher value is that either they are using a lower discount rate or they are unwinding the cash flows. And IS 36 strictly prohibits to um, use any of these two options in calculation of value of use. Value in use or reversal of impairment is allowed, but it is only possible if there has been any change into the cash flows, um, uh, you know, cash flows of the asset not by changing the discount rate or not by unwinding. Therefore, reversal of impairment is not allowed in this case. Last of all, the scenario mentioned about the compensation by the government. Uh, this Such a compensation by the government should be treated under IS 37, provisions, contingent assets and contingent liability. And this case seems to be like a, a case of contingent asset. However, in order to recognize the contingent assets into financial statements, contingent assets must, uh, should be uh, virtually certain. In this case, we know that the, the scenario says that the government has indicated that it may compensate and these two words do not account for virtual certainty. And, and since it is not virtual, uh, it is not virtually certain, therefore we should not recognize contingent asset. Uh, as regard to the compensation which is expected. So this is um, the possible solution to this question. You should break it down, which areas to address, make a list that these are the five points which I'm going to discuss, and then just start you know, writing them step by step.